we look again in the book of Esther, and uh, we'll be uh, going uh, from some selections um, throughout, the, throughout the book, and so guide us along as we go. But uh, Esther in, in the Bibles in your seat starts on page 354. Um, so turn there. Esther is one of the books uh, shortly before the Psalms. If you're not using the Bibles in your seats, you've got Psalms and Job's in front of that, and then uh, Esther's in front of that. We'll begin in Esther chapter 1, verse 1. And uh, we'll take a while here, so I want you just to get in the mentality of enjoying the story. Okay? Um, we need to see a lot of stuff here in order to see what God's saying to us. Uh, Esther chapter 1, uh, verse 1. This is God's word, uh, eternally true. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes, he ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. At that time, King Xerxes, reign, Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials, the military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. Now skip down to verse 10. Verse 10. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was high in spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, Mahuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zethar, and Karkas, to bring before him Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown, in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. Since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the times and were closest to the king, Karshena, Shathar, Admatha, Tarshish, Merez, Marsena, Makuman, Mamukan, the seven nobles of Persia and Media who had special access to the king and were highest in the kingdom. According to the law, what must be done to Queen Vashti, he asked. She has not obeyed the command of King Xerxes that the eunuchs have taken to her. Then Mamukan replied in the presence of the king and the nobles, Queen Vashti has done wrong not only against the king, but also against all the nobles and all the people of all the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's conduct will become known to all the women. And so they will despise their husbands and say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the Persian and Median women of the nobility who have heard about it who have heard about the queen's conduct, will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. And let the king give her royal position to someone else, who is better than she. Then when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all the, his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. The king and his nobles were pleased with this advice, so the king did as Mamukan proposed. He sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, to each province in its own script, and to each people in its own language, proclaiming in each people's tongue that every man should be ruler over his own household. Now down to chapter 2, chapter 2 and verse 5. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shermai, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiachin, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This girl, who was also known as Esther, was lovely in form and features, and Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many girls were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. 
The girl pleased the girl pleased him and won his favor immediately. He provided her with be, with her beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven maids selected from the king's palace and moved her and her maids into the best place in the harem. Now down to verse 12. Verse 12. Before our girl's turn came to go into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil of myrrh, and six with perfumes and cosmetics. Now verse 15. Verse 15. When the turn came for Esther, the girl Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihail, to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. Now verse 17. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. Now down to chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 3 at the beginning, verse 1. After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. Now down to verse 5. Verse 5. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. Now verse 8. Verse 8. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, there is a certain people dispersed and scattered among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom whose customs are different from those of all the other people and who do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them, and I will put 10,000 talents of silver into the royal treasury for the men who carry out this business. Now down to verse 12. Then on the 13th day of the first month, the royal secretaries were summoned. They wrote out in the script of each province and in the language of each people, all Haman's orders to the king's satraps, the governors of the various provinces, and the nobles of the various peoples. These were written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. Dispatches were sent by the couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and little children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so they would be ready for that day. Now chapter 4, verse 6. So Hathach went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show Esther and to explain it to her. And he told him to urge her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathach went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that he be put to death. 
The only exception to this is for the king to extend the gold scepter to him and spare his life. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. Now verse 15, verse 15. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will, do, will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom it will be given you. Now verse 6. As they were drinking wine, the king asked Esther, Now, what is your petition? It will be given you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. And now verse 9. Haman went out that day happy and high in spirits. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Now verse 14. His wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Have a gallows built 75 feet high and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go, to the king, then go with the king to the dinner and be happy. This suggestion delighted Haman, and he had the gallows built. That night the king could not sleep, so he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. What honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this? The king asked. Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. The king said, Who is in the court? Now, Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai and the gallows he had erected for him. His attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him, What should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought to himself, Who is there that the king would rather honor than me? So he answered the king, for the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on his head, on its head. Then let the robe and the horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honor and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew, who sits the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief. Now chapter 7, chapter 7, verse 1. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And as they were drinking wine on that second day, the king asked again, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half my kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, O king, and if it pleases your majesty, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. 
this is my request, not a verse 5. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Who? Where is the man who has dared to do such a thing? Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Verse 9. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A gallows seventy-five feet high stands by Haman's house. He had made it for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. That same day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came into the presence of the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. The king took off his signet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman, and presented it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed him over Haman's estate. Verse 7. King Xerxes replied to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, because Haman attacked the Jews, I have given his estate to Esther, and they have hanged him on the gallows. Now write another decree in the king's name in behalf of the Jews, as seems best to you, and seal it with the king's signet ring, for no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. Chapter 8, verse 11. The king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and to protect themselves, to destroy and kill and annihilate any armed force of any nationality or province that might attack them and their women and children, and to plunder the property of their enemies. Now, verse 15. Mordecai left the king's presence wearing royal garments of blue and white, a large crown of gold, and a purple robe of linen of fine linen and the city of Susa held a joyous celebration for the Jews it was a time of happiness and joy gladness and honor in every province and in every city wherever the edict of the king went there was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebrating and many people of other nationalities became Jews because fear of the Jews had seized them now at the very end, chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 2. Verse 2. And all his acts of power and might, together with a full account of the greatness of Mordecai, to which the king had raised him, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Media and Persia? Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes preeminent among the Jews and held high in esteem by his many fellow Jews because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of all the Jews. Uh, when the Beatles, yeah, I'm a big Beatles fan, when they came to America and they were in the Ed Sullivan Theater on February 9th, 1964, see, I didn't have to write that down, I just know it. Um, that the cameras got confused. And if you ever see video of when they first come on stage, in addition to the girls, you know, screaming, whatever that is, um, you see that the cameraman gets confused because at the time, uh, rock and roll bands had a leader and a backup group. So it was Chuck Berry and his backup group. It was Bill Haley and the Comets. And so they didn't know, but they didn't know because it was just the Beatles. And in fact, as the Beatles fumbled through finding a name for themselves, and they had about five, uh, they, they, the, one of the names was uh, like Johnny and the Crickets or something like that. I forget what it was. Uh, and, and John Lennon was Johnny, of course. But, but they were just the Beatles. And so the cameraman struggles, and he doesn't know who's singing lead as they sing. Um, uh, no. Lo uh, no, uh, uh, the first song they sang was Please Please Me. 
and, and as they're singing this, and, and actually John and Paul have some sharing of things, and you know, when, when one sings, then John and Paul in the background, or, 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 or vice versa and all that. And so you see the camera focusing on someone and then realizing, wait a minute, this guy, you know, it's focusing on John. Paul's singing lead here. And so then the camera shifts over to Paul. But then later in the song, it shifts uh, because, you know, there's some certain high parts and Paul's voice was a little bit higher than John. And so they had to shift around who sang lead in that song. And, and the question was, who's in charge here of this group? So we can focus on, so we can look to this person. Well, well the, the book of Esther is a book about who's in charge. Who is in charge? Who's sovereign over the universe? Um, and and it, oh, upon whom should we? Upon whom should we focus? And, and uh, the reason we have to read the, practically the whole book of Esther to get this is because you've got the book of Esther is a book of contrasts. And it's a book of opposites. You have this, then you have that flipped and overturned. You have this, and then that gets overturned. You have this, and then that gets overturned all through the book. And so if you just read you know, the, the one chapter early on, you don't see how it gets overturned later in the book. But all this book makes this, this, this point that as you see your gospel lesson title here is God in control for his, for his people. And so we see God is in control um, for his people. You know, we've, we've recently had two major hurricanes as we all know about not us but but uh florida and and, and texas and and um uh, betsy and i conversed about this when we we're watching tv as well and there's some disaster and the comfort to the person who's experienced disaster is this don't worry it'll be okay and we converse with each other and we say they have no basis for saying that if you don't believe there's a god if all things are random why why will things be okay? Why won't they be worse tomorrow? See, that's a blind faith. It's a faith that something in the universe is working on my behalf. Something in the universe is working and likes me and shows its favor upon me. The non-believer has no basis for saying everything will be okay. It may be worse tomorrow. But this book is about for God's people. We can legitimately say that. It will be okay. Because we know this universe isn't random, and we know we have a God who favors us, even though we don't deserve to be favored. He favors us because he has provided for us Jesus, his son, who's taken care of things for us. He's taken our sins upon himself and he suffered the penalty for our sins so we no longer needed to be need to be treated in justice and so this book is about for Christians things really will be okay now just a warning for you if you're talking with somebody just a little uh, if you're talking to somebody and they've experienced disaster be a little bit guarded about saying it'll be okay um, say, I'm really sorry this has happened, period, and shut up. Um, the time for letting people know things will be okay is before they enter crisis. So that when they enter crisis, then they know things will be okay. Um, but just, just be aware of that, just to be tender and, and sympathetic when people are going through crisis. Uh, but this book is, is about this. For us as people of faith, God says this to us, and this is the main, the main uh, point of the book, and, and if you want to fill out blanks in the outline, you're welcome to do that. It's this main point. You and I, God tells us, rest. Rest emotionally. Be at rest. Don't be worried. And continue in faith. Be at rest emotionally. Rest emotionally. Don't be worried and continue in faith in the world. Now, some factors that, that play into that, that allow us to rest emotionally. We actually say it'll be okay and can be at rest that things will turn out because we have some factual basis for it that God reveals to us here in the book of Esther as well as throughout Scripture. So, number one, 
Uh, first thing God says is, he says, be at rest emotionally. No matter what's going on in your life, no matter what chaos or craziness is going on, be at rest emotionally. And here are a couple of despites. God doesn't tell us, be at rest emotionally because everything's going well for you. He says, be at rest emotionally despite, number one, despite all indicators seeming to say that people and people who aren't for you or even people who are hostile towards you are determining things. So if you look with physical eyes, what you will see is that there are people, it looks like, there are people who are determining your fate, so to speak, your future, what's going on with you, whether you'll be okay or not. And some of these people just don't care about you. And some of these people may even be hostile to you. So this is, this is uh, uh, King Xerxes. He really doesn't care about the Jews. He doesn't even know who they are. Okay, and he's determining everything. He controls these, what is it, 127 provinces here? And then there's Haman, who's got absolute hatred for the Jews. And this communicates to us today. You know, and, and we know there are some people that don't care about us. That's most of the people on the earth. They don't even know we exist, but they don't care about us. Uh, but then there are some people who actually hate us and have an agenda against us, especially for being, for being believers. And, and, you know, you're, you know, you're, you know, what you say, you know, what this and that and the other, you know, how unfair, you know, they try to turn the tables uh, on us and things. But despite it seeming that people are determining things, rest emotionally. It seems like people are in control and in control of your well-being. Uh, so look down there at your verse references there, and, and, and I'll just kind of highlight what these are for you. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, it highlights that Xerxes' vast power. He is in absolute sovereign control of everything anyone can see. From India over to Kush, which is like Egypt and Ethiopia and, and, and all. Okay, he's in control of everything. And he's throwing a banquet, and his wealth is so great, you know, just everybody can drink as much wine as they want, and, and, and he doesn't care because he's just so much in control. He's controlling lots of things. Chapter 1, verses 22, and, and chapter 8, verse 9, it's Egypt to India is what he controls. Chapter 1, verse 19, he makes decrees, and they are unrepealable. I don't know if that's a word or not. It didn't show up in the Mac Dictionary. Maybe it's in the Oxford Dictionary or something. He, you, a law of the Medes and the Persians can't be repealed. So once he says it's to be done, nobody can overturn it. That's, that's the extent of his control. There's no veto that Congress can enact to overcome what Xerxes says to be, what Xerxes says to be true. And then uh, chapter 3, verses 1 and 12, we see another figure, Haman. And Haman is actually hostile, hostile towards God's people. And Haman, verse 1 of, of chapter 3, is, is highest in command. Xerxes is kind of a, 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 a low control. He's, you know, he's a Ronald Reagan, not a Jimmy Carter. You know, he's a low control guy, and he's letting, letting Haman run the kingdom for him. And Haman is running the kingdom, and he's controlling things. He's, he's got the king's signet ring. He's making laws. He's putting laws into effect that can't be repealed. And he hates God's people. So he's highest in power under the king. Chapter 3, verse 9, and, and chapter 5, verse 11, Haman, great wealth is emphasized here. He's completely in control, has everything he needs. He's the one dumping funds to support all the soldiers going out and killing all the Jews. He says, I'll put all this money into the treasury so that this can get done. He's in control. Uh, he doesn't even have to uh, be uh, um, uh, um, susceptible, I guess, or, 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 or in the position of weakness that the king might say, well, that's okay, but I'm not going to put any funds to this. Haman just takes care of it. He says, I'll put the funds in it, and we'll get this done. Haman's in complete control. Uh, chapter three, verses, um, or sorry, chapter 4, verse 11, uh, Esther, could, uh, Esther could see that she couldn't even talk to the king. She couldn't even talk to the king about her plight unless the king extended his scepter to her. Esther is not in control. The Jews are not in control. They can't even approach the king to tell him what's going on. 
The king is in control. Chapter 5, verse 14, and, and chapter 6, verse 4, and chapter 7, verse 9. A gallows, a hanging place, uh, uh, is uh, built for Mordecai, set up by the one in power, Haman. Haman is controlling Mordecai's future. And then chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. The public duty to destroy the Jews goes out to all. Everyone hears it. There's not going to be an escape. You hear the emphasis in this? There's not some part of the kingdom you can go to and escape the effects of this edict. They make sure they're in utter control. Every, have we covered every language in the kingdom, every province, so that everybody who's not a Jew understands they can kill the Jews on this certain day and, and take all their stuff. Utter control. Nothing left, no stone left unturned. So it looks like other people are in control. And so we all know situations like that in our lives where it seems like, well, other people are in control of my destiny. Uh, you're applying for a job or you're in a job or, or, or whatever it is, or, or you're trying out for a team or, or, or what, whatever, whatever the thing is, we know we're, we're underneath others who are controlling in some way our future. So that's what Mordecai and Esther could see. It's what they could see, wicked and or hapless uh, ignorant men in control. Um, and this is what also Jesus saw. That's your blank there. Just like Mordecai and, and, and Esther looked out and they saw, okay, who's in control? A wicked man, Haman, and a hapless man, Xerxes. And Xerxes is kind of made fun of through the whole book. Uh, here, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But, but Jesus could look out and see the same thing. Wicked and hapless ignorant men were in control. Um, Jesus looks out and it's the Pharisees in front of him. Uh, and, and it's people who don't understand the, the law that he's been teaching uh, who seem to be in control here. And in fact, um, are, are successfully able to sentence him to death, just like Mordecai had been sentenced to death. And Jesus actually goes to his death. Um, well, Esther speaks to this and speaks forward to this and speaks forward to our lives, too. Um, the world's not out there looking for our, our, out for our best interests. Second thing, rest emotionally, not only despite the, that it seems like people are in control of things, uh, as it was in Jesus' day as well, but rest emotionally, continue in faith, despite it often appearing that God is absent. Despite it often appearing that God is absent. It seems often that God is absent. And... Um, uh, sometimes people even say, you know, where is God? Um, big note for you here, A, in your outline, God is never mentioned in Esther. The word God, the word the Lord, never mentioned. That word is not mentioned in Esther. Okay, that's, that's your neat little trivia fact that all theologians talk about. And I, that's not a brilliant insight of mine. That's just study Esther, and that comes out immediately. God is not mentioned in Esther, and this drives a point B, the point. The two point is kind of uh, two-sided. God is invisible. We read about that, didn't we? God is invisible. Um, Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That's what faith is. We don't believe because we see. We believe in a God who is invisible. Uh, Jesus says upon his resurrection, Thomas, you know, blessed, blessed are you, you, you who see, but blessed are those who don't see and yet believe. Thomas saw and he, he touched the Lord upon his resurrection and, and, and he believed. He said, Lord, I believe. But Jesus says, blessed are those who don't see and believe. And that's who we, that's who we are. Uh, the, John speaks at the front of his gospel in John 1.18. There he says, he says that, that nobody has seen God, but Jesus has revealed him to us. Um, 2 Corinthians 4.18 that Jim read for us says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. And then see, um, 
Can you imagine what it would have been like uh, for you to be in Jesus' shoes during his life uh, here on the earth? Um, he had written the law. You know, John calls Jesus the word. Um, Jesus is the author of scripture. And he inspires scripture by his spirit in prophets in the Old Testament and, and apostles eventually in the New Testament. But he's the one who wrote the law. And the law itself reflects God's character. So Jesus' character is being reflected. So when Jesus talks about what the law means, he's just talking about himself. He's talking about his own character. Be merciful. Why? Because he's merciful. Be patient because he's patient. Be meek because he's meek. The law is just an extension of the characteristics of God himself. And Jesus is teaching about the law, and they're the little puny Pharisees whom he's created, whom he put together. Colossians 1, Jesus himself holds all things together. He was holding these people together as they spoke the words in defiance of, his, in defiance of him and said, you don't understand what the law means. Like talking to Mark Twain about who, who Jim is. Can you imagine what that was like for Jesus? As he stood before his detractors. Um, yet uh, before those detractors, God the Father didn't speak from heaven. God doesn't speak from heaven when Jesus is alive here on the earth and say, sit down and shut up. This is the eternal God you're looking at. And he's my beloved son. Shut your mouths and sit down. In fact, get your face to the ground. The father never speaks up. He's invisible. He's evident to anyone who will look and see the miracles of Jesus. But Jesus never gets defended by anybody. He's out there by himself, susceptible to the whims of sinful, wicked men who see him. And as we looked at in Sunday school this morning, Matthew 21, say, ah, this is the son. Let us kill him and we get the vineyard. To these people, uh, even to Jesus visually, the father was invisible. That's your blank. The father was invisible and didn't come to Jesus' defense before his detractors. When Jesus is standing there in Jerusalem and, and people are shouting, crucify him, and, and Jesus is carried off, the father doesn't speak from heaven and says, enough. That's enough. This is, Jesus. This is who he says he is. He is the king. He is my son. The father does not speak up. He's invisible. And that's what it's like in our lives. When we're before non-believers and we say we believe and we act as we act, God the Father doesn't speak from heaven to our detractors and say, sit down and shut up. They're right and you're wrong. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> but instead, we're always getting mis misinterpreted, misunderstood, and counted as fools. And we look like we're the, the, the people who have no power at all and in terms of physical stuff it's like we, we we don't as we talked about in obadiah so d here's the flip side of the point this point in esther that even though god is invisible even though god is not speaking audibly um, to non-believers to justify us and to commend us and say follow this person be like him believe like he does yet the point of Esther is this, God is real and he's active. We believe in the unseen God and so what we do with this truth uh, is we act according to it. But God is real and he is active. That's what, that's what Hebrews 11 says, Hebrews 11, 6 says. We're acting on things that are, that are not seen. But God is real. We believe that he exists and that he rewards those who actively seek him. So number three, number three. So we've said, you know, rest emotionally, continue in faith, despite all indicators seeming to say that people are determining things, despite it often appearing that God is absent. And here's what you do. We rest emotionally, 
because God not only exists, that's your blank, but he is also in control, not the people you see. It seems like it appears like the people you see are in control. But the message of Esther is even though God is invisible, even though his name's not even mentioned, that God's in control. God's in control. He exists and he's active. So A, there in your outline, the people you see are not in control despite appearances and despite their claims. And you see a lot of those claims here in the book of Esther. Claims of being in control. And look at all my kingdom and look at all my power. And Haman makes these claims as he throws banquets in his own house and, and gives like uh, parallel banquets to the King Xerxes in his own house to show, to show his power. Uh, but they're not determining things. This book is loaded with this point. And, and look at what happens to the power holders in this, in this book. Uh, and uh, I've listed the references here for, I'll just mention what happens in these references. So chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. King Xerxes, who controls 127 provinces, everything that's going on, all these languages, India to Kush, he can't control his wife. <laughs> he gets humiliated by a simple no from a woman. None of us husbands know what that's like. <laughs> he can't control his wife despite his power over many nations uh, chapter 1 verse 18 and verse 22 the powerful men of the land guess what these powerful nobles who give interpretation of the law who decide the laws they're scared of their own wives our wives will hear you know Vashti's done this and then we won't have control of our own household so what do they do verse 22 they have to write a law that says men are in control of their homes <laughs> they have to write a law to do that. See the humor of God in this? These great power holders who are doing great things in the public sphere of history have to write a law to control even their own, their own homes. Chapter 3, verse 5. Um, Haman decides when he's, he's going to, he creates this law and, and they cast lots. I left it out in the reading. I realized it as I was reading here. They cast lots for which month are we going to put this law into effect? Now, Haman's sitting there in the first month. And he casts lots for which month are we going to put this, this, this decree in effect where we'll destroy all the Jews? Guess which month it comes up on? The last month. It doesn't come up, so he's, you know, right in our terms, he's making this decree in January. And the lot doesn't fall in January. It doesn't fall in February. It doesn't fall in March. It doesn't even fall in July. It falls in December. <laughs> so he's trying to exercise his power to annihilate the Jews. He's fuming mad every time he sees Mordecai. And he's going to have to be fuming mad for 12 more months, right? So then he has to build this, this gallows, you know, to, to try to solve that. But do you see the humor of God? God controls the lots, just like Jonah on the ship, right? The lot falls on Jonah and correctly identifies. Now, don't gamble. But, but <laughs> it correctly identifies Jonah's responsible for this storm. And if you get Joshua off the boat, the storm will stop, and it does. But this power holder has his plans frustrated because God's in control. You want to do that right now, don't you, Haman? Okay, wait, 12, wait a year. Wait 12 months. Uh, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. The scepter hasn't been extended to Esther in 30 days. Guess what? God extends the scepter. So what appears impossible, and, and Esther's ready to die. But God extends the scepter to her uh, as, uh, because God's people fast before him. Uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, and, and chapter 5, verse, and, or sorry, and, and chapter 6, verses 5 through 12, 12. Haman has designed a gallows to kill Mordecai. And then Haman immediately, on the morning he goes to tell the king, let's hang Mordecai, the king says, wait a minute, before you tell me whatever you're going to tell me, what should I do for the man I delight to honor? And Haman has to lead Mordecai through the streets proclaiming, this is what happens to the man whom the king delights to honor. So, Haman is humiliated. 
Mordecai is exalted before all the people. Think God's in control here? Mordecai, or Haman wanted to be in control. Haman had the political power to do it. The king didn't care what Haman did. Sure, take my signet ring, do whatever you want, is what Xerxes' policy with Haman was. But instead, God's in control. And God not only gets Mordecai exalted and not killed, but he has Haman being the one exalting Mordecai. So verse 12, afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate. Chapter 6, verse 12. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief. Now chapter 7, verse 9, along with chapter 6, verse 4 and 5, 14 and 10, 3. On the gallows, Haman constructed for Mordecai. Haman himself is hanged. And the second command, who is Haman, becomes Mordecai. God is in control despite appearances. Despite the God we worship being invisible to us, this invisible God controls all things. Um, in addition, there's this edict that can't be changed to destroy the Jews. And so what happens? A reverse edict gets done. God controls all things, and he gets uh, Mordecai in charge, and the king says, here, Mordecai, you take the signet ring now, and you figure out some decree which reverses, in effect, in a practical way, what Haman had decreed that the Jews would be annihilated. And so Mordecai figures it out. Okay, we can't, we can't d dismiss the decree to annihilate the Jews, but we can create a counter decree that says, well, they can, the Jews can fight back and plunder you. By the way, the Jews didn't plunder. Um, they defended themselves. Um, okay, so that's the, that's the reverse of all this. God is in control, not the people you see. Now, B. All scripture points to Jesus, Luke 24, book of Hebrews. Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension prove this too. And, and Jim read for us in our declaration of the gospel this. Uh, Jesus' uh, uh, hardship in life is, is, is this great reversal, this great reversal. Um, Acts 2.23, and you can see it printed there on, the, on your bulletin, Declaration of the Gospel. Peter says, this man was handed over to you by what? By God's set purpose. See, that's not what we expect. This man was handed over to you at your doing by Pilate. By the Pharisees, no. They weren't really in control, Peter says. This man, Jesus, was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. Who was behind all the events we could see, Peter says? God was. God was. Uh, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. And so you thought all was lost. You thought there was a decree to annihilate you and to annihilate Jesus. But God, in his control, God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses to this fact that he is exalted to the right hand of God. Um, okay, so see Esther here. They were as good as dead. A decree had been declared that they were going to be annihilated. All of them, women, women, men, and children, and their stuff was going to be taken, and the decree couldn't be revoked. So their fate was sealed, or so they thought, until God enters in and reveals that he's in control. And same thing with Jesus. Jesus' fate was sealed. He actually went to the cross, and he died, and he was in a grave. And we thought his fate was sealed. But then we see, no, it's God. It's God in control. And beyond this, beyond his resurrection, he's ascended to the right hand of God. You know what the right hand of God is? Second in control. Like Mordecai, chapter 10, verse 3. God's in control. He can, he can put this gatekeeper this one despised by men, just someone at the gate that you don't see and you don't, you don't know his name. You just pass by him. Make him second in control of this vast kingdom from India to Kush. And Jesus at the right hand of God, second in command, 
uh, next to the Father in heaven, is in control of this vast kingdom. Not from India to Kush, but from India to India, 360 degrees around the earth. Men from every tri tribe, tongue, and nation uh, worshiping Jesus, a part of the kingdom, a part of the kingdom of God. So Jesus uh, proves this in his resurrection and ascension, that God is in control, not human beings. So despite all appearances, God is in control. Now a qualification, C, C, a qualification. God's being in control doesn't mean, as we talked about last week from Oklahoma, everything's going my way. Okay, it doesn't mean everything's going your way. Um, things weren't going God's people's way. They were experiencing real grief. Uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, Mordecai and the Jews, they're really moaning and, and groaning and crying and wearing sackcloth and ashes. Things weren't going their way, and often they don't go our way on the earth. Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians 4 and says, you know, we have affliction on this earth. He just says, but in comparison with eternity, it's momentary and light. But really, we have affliction on this, on this earth. So um, what does that mean? Um, let's, hold, let's hold this off for next week. We'll pick up with, uh, we'll pick up with number four uh, next week and, uh, and, and continue on in this. Uh, but hearing, this, hearing good, this good news, as we live as, as believers, as we live as believers in Jesus, um, it's faith. That's what we're called to. We're called to believe in the invisible to believe in something we can't prove to the non-believers around us who don't want to believe. But we walk forward. We continue in our faith. And even when there are circumstances around us that are very threatening, that are threatening because there are other people who are determining certain things around us, whether they're people who are just kind of hapless and don't care about us or people who actually hate us, we're to, we're to remember, God is in control. God is in control. And we're just sitting in the same place Mordecai and Esther were sitting in. And we can say, honestly, things will be okay. Because it's not Pilate. It's not the Pharisees. It's not the maddened crowd of the Jews who are really in control. Let's pray.